friends, and welcome to Ask Zach. Today, we're taking a trip down to J.D. Simo's basement studio, the House of Greece, and we are going to have some wah talk. He is going to give us some history. He is going to clue you in on the best bang for your buck vintage wah. It's, uh, you, you got to watch for it, but he's going to give you all the info you need to find a killer wah and a killer price. He's also going to calibrate my old 70s wah-wah to make it where it, it has the, the best vocal sound on it. So you're really going to enjoy this. On top of that, JD is going to show you his new pedal board that he just put together for fly dates. And it's a really cool little board that's very versatile. And he's going to talk a bit about string joy strings that he's been using and also headstrong amps. It's a, it's a fun kind of little uh, rundown of his, uh, of his rig that he's using now. While you're thinking about it, please hit subscribe. If you've already done that, and think about uh, supporting the show in some way. There's tip jar information. Also, there's information for Patreon. And you can go to AskZach.com to find merch. Finally, I need to thank TrueFire for sponsoring today's episode. They are the finest online lesson system there is. And JD just happens to also be a TrueFire artist, so please Check out TrueFire, and you can use the code AskZach30 to get 30% off. All right, enjoy. Well, here we are. We're down at the House of Greece with our our buddy, JD. You know it. And look what he's got. He's I've, I've got Zach's Sepulveda, Sepulveda, California, Crybaby. Now these, mine's over here. I'll show you mine in a minute, but... People are going to be upset at me, friends of mine, um, because these are like the last good deal in vintage was. Um, you can get these for, I'm not going to say how much, but they're, they're cheap. Because um, people kind of malign them. They, you know, Hendrix didn't use one. So, you know, um, but a lot of other notable people used this era, you know, mid 70s into late 70s. So the big thing <clears throat> about a Sepulveda is it's got this big square um, plastic inductor, okay? But as you see, the rest of the board is all old Allen Bradleys, you know? Um, and um, the inductor makes a difference, but I don't mind the sound of these. I like the sound of of, of, of these plastic inductors. Um, so the ones before this are the stack of dimes ones? That there's, are... a, there's a stack of dimes. <clears throat> there's, there's a, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now, a trash can. It looks, it's a big, it's a little silver one. I had a really nice trash can box 10 years ago. It was one of my favorites, but then it went microphonic. And when the, when the, when the inductors go microphonic, there's really nothing you can do. I've tried doing crazy things like trying to trying to flash pot it and stuff like that and save them. But meaning when they go microphonic, like literally you can just hit the side of it with your foot and you can hear it through your amp. Like yeah. it just gets to the point where <clears throat> it just is unusable, unfortunately. It's really loud. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, no, there's stack of dimes, trash can, and the original Halo inductors. Um, and there's probably some more. I'm not, I have friends that are authorities on this stuff. I, I know enough to get myself in trouble, so don't hold anything to me. But one of the main things <clears throat> you do with these is, um, uh, I like to true bypass. Uh, Zach has already true bypassed this. Um, it, it definitely, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing to do to these, um, Hopefully it still has the iCar pot, but as long as it's a good pot or get a pot from Chase Tone. I'm a big fan of the Chase Tone pot. They're like 15 bucks on eBay. Um, and they're as good as an old iCar as far as I'm concerned. So that's nothing to get wound up over. It's really just you want a good board. Um, so what we're going to do is um, I listen to this. And you set the treadle of the, uh, of the arm of the pot by this set screw here. And you just, I'm going to loosen it 
so that I can pull back this and I'm going to just notch this a little bit more, trying to get a little bit more, just trying to get a little bit more of the sort of waka waka sound out of it. And now I'm gonna listen to it before I completely tighten it down. And it's all preference, but these were all set random. And a lot of people nowadays with capacitors and stuff will have switches on Wawa's where, oh, it's brighter and it sounds more like shaft or um, it's more mid-rangey so it sounds like Hendrix or it's real bassy so it sounds like white room. But really it's just, you just, the set screw in there, just set it how you want it and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry about it. So let me listen and see. Usually a turn or two, you know, it doesn't take much. So did it go to to brighter or which which direction? I'm wanting to get it brighter, um, but it's still a little too dark. Yeah. Um, but you know, as with most things, a little goes a long way. So I'm just going gradual because hopefully you can accomplish it relatively quickly and not have to mess with this for an hour so i have friends that are you know really into this and will spend long periods of time doing this but i'm of the mindset of let's accomplish what we are trying to accomplish and be done with it really you just want enough so that you're getting that sort of waka waka and and it's easier to hear like if you're looking, I like that sort of uh, R and B, '70s R and B, Memphis kind of wah wah sound, and so putting it on the neck pickup. There we go. I'm gonna do just one tiny one literally one click more and I think we're we're in there. It's fun when you hear it. Zach and I have been talking about Wawa in general and um, of course my way into Wawa was not unlike many others in that, you know, Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan and all that kind of stuff. But now it's very different in that, uh, to me, the, the sound of the R&B guys, like Skip Pitts and Michael Tolls and most of the guys in Memphis, whoops. So we just had a fun time. Uh, you know, we couldn't find the screw, and then you know, luckily JD had a. Uh, there it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then we found it. Yes. yes. No. No. So we've got it back together. So I'm gonna listen to this now because it should be right, right where I want it. But we will see. And a lot of this stuff. Um, I'll mention. People ask me about pickup height a lot. There is a method to the madness, but as you're seeing with this, it's you just listen to it, you know, and you tweak until it sounds good, you know, it's it's pretty that sort of teeny Hodges. Thank 
And then also using it like like a filter, so for like uh, Leo No Centelli. you got a good one here and uh, mr mr child and uh never thought i'd see the day where you got a wawa pedal this is wonderful well it's it's all because of you and it's all because of you helping me out and and i had no idea that the travel changed on them that yeah. it's like why why in the world did they do that i mean i don't know i still don't know the because, yeah, the space on the old ones is relatively short. And if you're used to modern ones that have kind of a wide throat, it takes some getting used to because it, if you can turn the wah-wah off real easily, especially in the toe-up position. But you sort of get used to... So... song on the first no it's not the first i think it's the second or third al green record um it's called right now right now and michael tolls is playing guitar and it's uh or whatever you play really you know any, clean yeah any idea when they changed that or does it just seem to be like in the 80s that they got the longer travel definitely by the 80s okay but certainly 60s and 70s they're always short like this and um yeah i don't know i think you know like i said you know i got into using wawa pedals like anybody else would you know you, you hear led zeppelin or something you know um but definitely, as I've gotten older, um, fallen in love with the, like, Funkadelic and um, Isaac Hayes and the, the, the R&B stuff, um, the use of it, I think, is real cool. And um, I dig the uh, guys like Skip Pitts, who is literally the guy from Shaft, you know, the guy who did... <laughs> And I mentioned Michael Tolls, who played on, um, um, he played on uh, Walk On By, so, hyperbolic uh, for Isaac Hayes, which is, you know, and um, a whole bunch of others, but 
we've discussed, uh, um, Zach and I have discussed how most of those Memphis guys are actually using boomerang wawas, which I've had some boomerangs in my time as well. Um, and boomerangs, they're, they've never skyrocketed in price. I haven't looked lately. You might still be able to get them boomerangs for decent. I would recommend that. With a little bit of work, you can make a boomerang similar, make a boomerang really cool. Um, and, and this kind of, you know, you, you talking about that hits on the whole fact that so much of what gear people used back in the day had to do with what the local music store had. Right. And that's why, you know, all the Memphis guys were using the boomerang wah and such. And They were because yeah. O.C. Hauk, which is a is a music store that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, but that's where Scotty Moore got his, all of his guitars they played with all this, um, including like, you know, Scotty had a Telecaster, maybe even been a broadcaster, I'm not sure, but... He had a Telecaster in really or before he met Elvis. Right. But anyway, every guitar he had uh, was a, was all purchased at O.C. Hauk. Bill Black's bass and his basement amps and all that were bought at O.C. Hauk. All of Elvis's guitars were bought at O.C. Hauk. His D18, his J200 that he got from Gibson was... I don't know if it was purchased. It might have been given to... I don't know. There's... You know, there's probably stuff online where you can find out for sure, but I know it was shipped to O.C. Hauk because Scotty picked it up for him. Um, but anyway, O.C. Hauk was a Gibson dealer, so they didn't carry Vox amps, so therefore they didn't have Vox Wawa pedals. But because they were Gibson dealer, they carried Maestro. So they had, they didn't have fuzz faces, they didn't have Vox Wawas, but they had Boomerang Wawas and they had uh, FZ1A uh, Maestro fuzz tones. So yeah. consequently. Um, when all these guys in the late 60s went to get a fuzz tone or a wah-wah pedal, that's all they could get, you know. And the boomerang wah does sound a little different. It's um, uh, it, it's a different type of inductor. It's a different, slightly different layout, um, but definitely worth... They're going to be a little bit more expensive than the Sepulveda, um, but definitely worth uh, messing around with. Yeah. You ask Zach folks out there so anyway this this is you know i don't want to steal from from your show or anything no you want to just tell tell us about this little board that you just because <laughs> it's it's fun it's little and i'm i'm not you know there's there's no there's no no no, no but i called zach uh because i'm doing a lot of um i have already this year flown way more than i want to <laughs> um and i'm I'm doing a lot more live and studio stuff out of town that isn't mine, like that I'm doing for other people, in addition to my own touring and stuff. So consequently, my rig is shrinking, both by necessity and also I'm just tired of it. Like I just don't, I just want to be able to play and do what I'm supposed to do. And so um, I actually watched Zach's uh, Vegas episode and when he showed his board, I went, man, that thing's nice and tiny. It would fit in my suitcase. And as you see, I don't really use a lot of stuff, you know. So this is the stuff I pretty much use all the time. Really, when it comes down to it, I use the freeze pedal a lot. Um, that's sort of something I've gotten in the habit of using. Um, and then I love this uh, jam. I love everything jam makes, but this is their Delay Llama, and it's the earliest one, which doesn't have the subdivision switch. And I like this better because um, it's it's analog. So I've got it set up for like a room thing now. And I like it. But the thing I like about this is I can get it to glitch out on itself. succeed in doing it there because it is kind of temperamental but anyway the point I'm making is this is a really great analog not that really different than a DM3 really I like 
how the delays just sort of sit underneath. They don't really... But um, so anyway, I dig that, and then I always whatever amp. Right now, I'm playing through my Headstrong uh, Little King Reverb, which is my favorite amp. Really, I use it all the time. We're set up for a session in here tomorrow that we're doing for somebody. But um, I always have a reverb and tremolo switch for whatever Fender amp I'm using, so I can turn the reverb. <laughs> I got really, uh, actually Zach was with me. I don't use overdrive at all, except for when I'm playing slide and I'm playing soft. So to, to <laughs> explain that, so like if I'm playing, um, like there's a tune I do called Mortgage on My Soul, which I usually put a drone like this under. back on my volume control I'll turn the, the J Rocket Archer icon like almost as a compressor. I don't use it when I'm full up. I just use it when I'm playing soft and I want just a little bit more to hold up the slide. And Zach was with me and I tried out a bunch of overdrives for this purpose. And I like that one the best. And I also like the broadcast. Um, they're both very different from one another, but I tend, I've been tending to favor the, the Archer icon for that purpose. And then other than that, I have my own Wawa pedal that I use that I just keep off the board because it doesn't need to be on one. And then I've really gotten into, this is a weird fuzz pedal made by Kogoi Music Devices, which is this guy in North Carolina, a fellow friend, a session guy, uh, Robbie Crowell turned me on to this. Um, and it's, it's hard to describe um, because it can do, it's kind of a Swiss army knife of fuzz pedals where it, I've got it set kind of radical where it, where it gates a lot, where that kind of thing where it gates really, or if I go all the way up. sustain it can have so it can kind of do both things but i've got it set where it's kind of rizzy for that sort of maestro sound you know um that old r&b you know with a lot of reverb you know sitar sounding at times yeah um and i just really like it that's become like the favorite and then of course the danicaster that i have because of zach zach told me to go to dan strain's house and <laughs> well uh, you know that's that's the uh, friendly kind of uh you know peer pressure where you, you just keep saying you need to get another telly you need to play a telly again. you need to play a telly again even if it's not permanent just you know Give us a spell of some telly. Indeed. Just a little bit. And I fell in love with it. This is my favorite. I play it all the time. And uh, it's uh, um, another thing Zach and I talk about a lot are strings. These are String Joy, which is a company here in Nashville. These are their uh, Broadways, which are round core 
right? Round core nickel, pure nickel round core, which yep. is the old school um, type of wind. Um, and it's certainly like this guitar in particular in the middle position does his Cornell real well, I think. <laughs> like what you say about pure nickel strings you, you say it makes it sound like a record it does it does make it sound like especially when you're playing clean yeah uh you know or. there know that's booker t jones playing that right you've talked about that i'm sure yeah i've talked because that's it, my favorite intro yeah. in history and everybody plays it different i play yeah. it different you play it different yeah. leventhal plays it different who knows how booker played it but that's you know. one of the things where i would love to interview booker t to talk about you know of course his keyboard work but just his his guitar work would just be a lot of fun to talk about just because it's like it's great i thought yeah it, i mean my whole life i thought it was proper yeah, yeah. And, and it's and up until maybe ten years yeah. ago, and, and I'm just gonna say it. I mean, it's more sophisticated than proper. it is. It's slightly yeah. more sophisticated, but you think to yourself, oh, you know, he could have worked it out, and, right? You know, it's a beautiful. It's definitely more in the vein of something Reggie would have played, but yeah. but it's my favorite. But no, but playing, um, and I also have my tone control. Here's the other thing about this guitar. So, the tone control is only wired to the bridge pickup, so. This, the neck humbucker is always wide open. But that's cool because I have a really wide range in the middle. Um, so even like when I'm playing like more jazz. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not like a traditionally like just dark neck pickup sound but the cool thing that i like is like playing r&b kind of guitar like i can get it to be pointy but it's never like pointy you know and and if people want to uh to wire their guitars up that way i have a schematic on my website where you, you take the the tone control off the neck pickup and it's really super handy like it's, it's always going to make the neck pickup sound better regardless of what it is but i don't know i've just kind of when when dan was because dan was really sweet about this guitar and that he was like take it and make sure that it's like that you're really into it like don't just like jump into it he's like make sure and he's like i don't know he's like he's like you might not like the way it's wired you might not you know it's and the difference in volume between this and this are pretty vast. And he's like, it might throw you off kilter. And it doesn't actually, actually where this has stayed height wise, the neck pickup, I set, and this is something I've never done before, but I would suggest to Telecaster players in general is like set your bridge pickup, like set your bridge pickup first and get it where that's sounding awesome. And then instead of like flipping back and forth, set the height of the neck pickup in the in-between position. Yeah. Because then you can make the in-between position kick ass. Okay. That's my suggestion, which is what I did on this guitar. And it just makes this in-between position. It's just a killer. And then I can make it super bright too. But again, uh, the strings make a big difference with just making it not sound, I don't know, it's kind of gacky is the term I use, you know, most new strings. The, these string joys sound, they 
just they do they sound like a record they don't have this like bump and again like once you start playing with distortion or um or fuzz or or even like a lot of wetness like a lot of delay or a lot of reverb or something like that it kind of clouds all that but when you're playing like super clean like this like sort of teeny hodges you know this kind of thing or love and happiness you know Buddy, thank you, thank you for uh, you know, for you know, fix fixing my wah. I didn't fix nothing. And I just you know, it. getting it uh, getting it dialed in and and uh, man, you know, just for the hang. And we we had tacos before this that were just amazing. And uh, yeah, yeah, if you it's a, it's if a good you need day. to know if you need to know where the best tacos in Nashville are, like message Zach and Zach will tell you because we can't have this. We can't yeah. have the information just out there, out there. Yeah. But if you must know, if you must know, if you're because it hasn't been overtaken by, by the by the <laughs> multitudes, it's still funky and off the beaten path, you know. So all right, we've we've teased them enough. Indeed. All right, thank you, JD. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you guys. Coming. Thank you so much for watching today. Again, I need to thank True Fire for sponsoring today's episode. And again, you can use the code. Ask Zach 30 to get 30% off and use the link in the description. Thanks. Bye-bye.